When we think about addiction, I think a lot of us think about addiction to substances, you know, sugar, alcohol, drugs. But there's another addiction that I've been thinking a lot about over the last few years, and that's this addiction to our stress hormones, right? That we've lived a certain way. So speaking to, you know, this idea of the familiar self versus the unfamiliar future, right? You you mentioned there about people may not like the fact that this is a process. There is no end point here. No, it's always going to be a little bit unfamiliar. You're just getting better and better. But there's still going to be those moments where it's like, oh, this is an area where I've got a bit of work to do. Oh, here's another area I've got a bit of work to do. This is not failure. This is progress. This is an opportunity for growth. But one thing I've I've seen in myself in the past, but I observe a lot these days, is that there are sanctioned and celebrated addictions, like a work addiction. And I've noticed, I know people, this was me, right? We, I was on holiday with my family recently, and um, we went abroad, and s- something really quite remarkable and profound happens for me. I could just sit there. I, I always get up early. I love to get up early before everyone and do my own self-care practices. But I'd often sit there with a coffee and then the coffee would be finished. I'd be on the balcony and the sun was shining. And I'd just be for 30, 40 minutes. I wasn't trying to put a podcast on. I wasn't trying to do something else. I wasn't even trying to write a journal, as helpful as that can be. And I thought five years ago, I could not have done that. I, I needed to be busy. I needed to be doing stuff. And you know, something you just said there really made me think about that because I think many people, they think, oh, I'm not a drug addict. I don't have a problem with alcohol. Yeah, but they can't stop working. They can't sit still. And I think the underlying drive behind it is actually not that dissimilar. I wonder what your perspective is on that. 100%. And I think um, if we even want to, you know, addiction, how, how any sort of addictive behavior, let's make it really global, is defined again really simply is, you know, the, the feeling of being compelled to engage in whatever activity it might be. And you've just given a, a bunch of different examples, socially approved and not so socially approved, of course, right? Despite the possible dysfunctional or, or negative con- consequences. So really what an addiction embodies is this idea of right, continuing to do. And this is where I think it gets confusing for these more validated or celebrated ones like work, like achievement, mm. is that even I'm sure I'm imagining people listening, hearing me say that they're like, well, there is no, there is no, there's no downside of working, right? I'm, I'm motivated. I'm successful. I might even be building, you know, generational resources, financial for my yeah. family, right? There is no downside. Um, with, I think the reality being, and I think what we're insinuating and why we are throwing it into the camp of, yes, it actually becomes a compulsive behavior is because I think the downside for a lot of people that are engaging in that type of achievement work-based addiction is they're not attuned to the impact that it is actually having on your body. I don't Mm -hmm. believe the human body is. And again, I I think a lot about just us, us over time evolving as a species and what life looked like right eons ago versus what it looks like now for us. And it looks quite different, right? Mm -hmm. Nine to five work weeks weren't really right. And working in the way that we work and living in the cities, the way that we live wasn't really the natural Mm -hmm. um, environment that our bodies needed. Um, I also have learned, right. That anything that's really consistent is something that I'm coming to the awareness of, like the 80, 90, you know, supersized work week that so many of us with this idea that we do that every week, season after season. (laughs) To me, that's so unnatural, right? The human is seasonal. We go through, and I'm sure people can even, you know, attest to, yeah, in the winter, my energy feels different than in the spring and the summer, right? Where we are fluctuating, even going back to this idea of energy, right? We are moving, fluctuating creatures. So even for the many of us, again, who have been celebrated by these endless working achievements, again, I could make it an argument that the, the consequence often, again, is, is exhaustion, is overstepping emotional limits, is what aren't you tending to now possibly or putting your time and attention on because it's all going devoted, yeah. right, to work. And more so, 
Is there any other way? Because what I view addiction or any of these self-regulating behaviors is an attempt to do just that, to relieve suffering, to relieve pain, to help me feel a bit better or to navigate. Maybe it is the stress hormones that my body has gotten so used to. So I see any behavior that we're habitually engaging in, maybe even compulsively engaging in, if it is our only way right? If working is the only way that I can feel better, right? Then again, we, we might want to get radically honest because anything that only, that limits us, right? For an opportunity, like there's no other way yeah. to release this tension, to feel safe, to regulate ourselves in that moment. Then again, I might call it to just to explore yeah. a bit. Um, if you can make other choices, if there can be other resources, other ways that you can care for your body. And just, again, speaking very similar to a lived experience, mm-hmm. sitting in silence, in stillness, meditating, right? All these traditional things that for a very long time I'd heard could be really helpful was nothing that I ever in my body felt safe doing for mm. a very, very long time. To sit in stillness, we have to have some level of safety in our nervous system. Our body has to mm. feel it is okay to stop moving, to stop scanning, to stop being on alert for that threaded hand. And if my body is a ball of tension, if I have cortisol racing through it, maybe from nothing that's even happening objectively immediately Mm -hmm. in my environment right now, maybe because I'm reliving an argument I had this morning, maybe because I'm worrying about something to do tomorrow, maybe because I've never released, right? This trauma I've carried with me for a lifetime. So now while I might be hearing that meditation, wanting to give myself this moment of stillness that you know you, we might have heard is so helpful, when I actually go to stop my body, what I'm tuned into, what my mind is going to scan down and receive messages around is that it's not actually safe. What are you doing, Nicole? My muscles are tense, my heart rate is pounding. There's something threatening. No, yeah. absolutely, you can't stop right now. You gotta get your ass moving and get away from this problem and, and or, constantly race in your mind, right? If my body is sending a message that I'm tight, that I'm threatened, that I'm stressed, it's only a matter of time that my mind is gonna need to make sense of why my body is so stressed. So if we really wanna simplify this conversation, there's so many of us who can't just sit still, just relax, just meditate. In those moments, the reason maybe why you can't embody peace is because your body isn't embodying peace because your body is activated and it won't allow you. So going back to this idea of right, stress addiction, hormone addiction, I call it emotional addiction, right? We can become so familiar ingrained in our body's musculature tension that that is our state of being. Yeah. So we can't logic away. We can't just say, just, just chill, right? Because our body isn't chill. <laughs> yeah. It, that is such an important point you've raised because I think a lot of people end up feeling bad where they hear about solitude or meditation or mindfulness and go, I can't do that. I've tried, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. But you just beautifully explained that it is a process. And that's a beautiful part in this book where you write about this idea that actually you can't hack this process. You can't speed it up, nor would you want to speed it up. And I, I, I think that's a really beautiful sentiment for people. The process is where all the gold is. You get all the discoveries along the way. You kind of don't want to go from A to Z without passing through B, C, D, E, F. Do you know what I mean? Even though in the moment you may think you you want to get to the end point, the goal is actually by going through that journey, I think. I actually very intentionally and strategically capitalized on the one. So the new workbook, of course, is entitled How to Meet Yourself, being two separate words, that self I'm referencing being your authentic self, imagining that most people who happen upon the workbook or have heard of my work are really eager to get to that meeting of that authentic self, right? I imagine that's why people would pick up a book like this for the end of the journey. So very strategically and intentionally for all of the reasons that we've unpacked on our conversation here today, I've separated um, the workbook into three major sections with almost like a prequel, if you will. Um, And the prequel is all about, and I'm sure by this point in the conversation, this might not be surprising to hear, creating safety and consciousness. How can I be conscious in my body? And what are some tools like this, the physiological side, breath work? Because I think as many of you have been listening, I hope are understanding how integral safety is to be in a safe body really then does allow us to begin to explore Mm -hmm. deeper feelings, deeper wounding that we're bringing from our conditioning. And it ultimately eventually allows us to then meet our authentic self. So while I'm very aware um, that once you progress through 
resourcing yourself with safety creating tools, we enter into the realm of the body for everything that we've talked about mm. because it is so foundational because so many of us are living with dysregulation, sending those signals to our mind. Once we build in that foundational reconnection to our body, begin to meet our body's needs, then we progress peeling back the next layer which is in terms of our mind and all of the beliefs and in our inner child and our ego and our shadow and everything that's living up in our mind, often driving people pleasing behaviors yeah. again, that keep us again, disconnected from ourselves. And then it is only when, right, we've peeled back all of that layers mm -hmm. of the onion that now we enter into the authentic self section. So again, I say I've done that intentionally with yeah. the hope that readers of the workbook, while I do hope it to be a book we can live with, a roadmap that many, maybe some of us choose to read from cover to cover and then go back and really begin or embody the yeah. journey. My hope and suggestion is that it is proceeded sequentially, right? We don't just yeah. go right to, or it is you proceed through it, I should say, in a more sequential manner um, that yeah. we don't just dive right into, because again, it will be very difficult to connect with that deeper space of passion, of purpose, to feel passionate, purposeful, creative, and imaginative. We have to I'm sure this again won't come as a surprise. Feel safe enough. When we're yeah. not safe, our body is not going to prioritize. It's going to prioritize our survival into that next moment. Dreaming, imagining, creating. That is so far down on our priority list that we won't be able to connect. So even those of us who try to skip through to section three, um, again, acknowledging yeah how important it is to peel back all of that onion. And to go back to something about that porch that's striking me that I just want to offer here now. My opinion, I'm of the opinion that our goal, when we peel back that onion and create these moments where we can attune to what we really want and who we are and meet our authentic self and then be that person in the world. That's the goal, I believe, mm. for our human existence, if you ask me, but hopefully um, the goal for this workbook. My hope is that that goal translates into many of those moments on the porch, meaning of pure existence, consciousness, presence of just being, yeah. not doing. And this is, again, the reason why I want to emphasize this. Healing can even be something that we hyper do, right? <laughs> yeah. There's so many of us that I've heard, right? That won't, won't allow that moment on the porch where I'm just staring off into the distance because I might assume or assign that that's, that's, that's not me healing. I'm not being accurate. I'm not really getting down into it. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the goal is actually to have more moments. Yeah. That is life. Life does live in each little present moment shift change that's happening here now. It's not being hyper-focused, hyper-analysis of my thoughts, hyper, you know, viewing myself in every given moment, always thinking I should be doing something different. It's actually being able to inhabit yeah. that. So what life looks like is less doing even internally. Again, I see so many people that are like, do you ever take time off, Nicole, from healing? I'm like, that's the goal is to just <laughs> always be right in yeah, that state of pure presence. The goal isn't healing isn't hyper-focused, hyper-analyzing, hyper-judging, hyper-criticizing, even hyper-doing internally either. Awareness, again, is a state of just simply being, of witnessing, of, again, having more moments on that porch or wherever it is where you're just being. in your presence of the moment at hand, yeah. whatever that might be. There's two quick things I hope we can cover. One is to do with relationships, Nicole, and that is that Many people who follow my work, I imagine you follow your work, who listen to this show, will often say, hey, Rongan, I get it. You know, I understand, but my partner doesn't. And, you know, with all your expertise and wisdom, I wonder if you can um, share some insights that may be helpful for people who are listening, who are doing the work, and maybe they're going to get your workbook and do even more work on themselves, but find that they're in an environment where the person around them or the people around them are stuck in patterns that they no longer want to be a part of. Do you have any advice for those people? Absolutely. So again, acknowledging first the natural human tendency to want different for other people in our life. And usually again, simplifying it, it usually comes, um, you know, kind of in two ways. We want differently because this relationship I'm in with this person, I'm struggling in some way, right? Like me. It's not deep enough. There's, you know, dynamics that aren't serving me. I don't feel seen, heard, whatever it might be, right? I want you to change so that I can feel different. Really simplifying, that's one version of why we look outward. We urge people around us to change. Another version is I'm doing all this incredible work. I'm making magic in my life and I see you suffering. Maybe I'm not even doing a super a lot of magic in my life. Maybe I just see you suffering and I love you and I want you to feel better and or I am making magic and I want you to have mm -hmm. this magic too. Again, really natural to want to relieve the suffering 
of our loved ones by taking them along our journey with us or want them to have these amazing right changes, transformations that we're having. So very, very natural, I think, to have any version mm-hmm. or all versions of that desire for someone else to change. And like I referenced earlier, I think one of the most difficult aspects of the human experience is really understanding how limited we are to changing other oh, people. Yeah. <laughs> Even our, and again, this I know this might be difficult to hear. And while I can't fully relate because I don't have you know children of myself, I at least personally believe this applies even to our children. We can punish, we can try to right shift and change and urge them to behave in certain ways, probably even for their best interest. Though in reality, what likely will happen in those moments is just like we did, we'll adapt, we'll modify, right? That child will listen to you per se, but the question is, are you really changing, right? Who they are, can you even? So I guess what I'm ultimately bringing up is the reality, in my opinion, at least that we can't change yeah. anyone outside of ourselves for all the reasons that we've even been talking to together today. Change is a lot. Mm-hmm. It's the daily commitment of new choices yeah. more often than not, right? It has to be the human who's going to then show up and make those new choices. We can wish well, we can want well, we can love everyone around us and want different. Yeah. We might even want relief and need relief in our relationship with that person though again, to allow that to happen for us, we have to focus on us. So that is of course to say, if there's a problematic dynamic, dysfunctional, if there's active abuse, right? As we come to this awareness, this doesn't mean condoning. You don't hear Dr. Nicole say, oh, well, we can't change them. So then we just continue to allow it. Absolutely not, right? To protect ourselves, change the dynamic to keep ourselves safe. We might have to put up new boundaries, new limits, limit contact, communication, whatever it might be. We though have the responsibility to creating, to separating ourselves yeah. from that person. And then the beautiful by- byproduct, as we continue to make the changes that we need, regardless of what they will or won't do, and acknowledging that probably for a lot of the receivers of us being different in whatever way it is, at minimum, they're going to be surprised because you're going to be violating some expectations that a lifetime of your relationship have validated. If you're always there on the second call, the second phone ring, right? Going yeah. back to that example, the other person is going to be surprised when it rings seven times and you didn't answer at minimum. And then of course it can get much more complicated when their conditioning gets involved, yeah. when they begin to make meanings over you're not, right? And then the reaction might not be welcoming of your beautiful new change that you're making for yourself yeah. and the better of the relationship, right? It could be screaming, yelling, upset, hurt, abandoned feelings, whatever it might be. Yeah. However. The more we stay committed, regardless of how they're reacting to our changes and stay committed to creating that change for ourselves, one of two things happen, sometimes both. The first thing is we actually do change the dynamic. We create safety where we need it. We create space for our own needs to be met in the fact that I didn't answer that call, regardless of how you feel about it, my needs now, right, are being considered in that moment. So over time, I'm actually shifting the dynamic myself. Even if you keep calling me, right? I won't answer. So now the dynamic feels different inherently for me, regardless if you've done anything. Second possible byproduct is over time, our loved ones might be looking and experiencing us in a new way that they too want to become then inspired to change. So that desire, right? That often does come from a very well-intentioned space of, I don't want you to suffer, right? I want you to be on this amazing journey with me alongside of me, right? Might be the motivation of them seeing and experiencing back to that child, right? Partners, again, have said this to other members of the community. Wow, you're different. Mm. What are you doing? I want more of that. I want that for me. So again, motivating, I think a lot of us very well intentionally try to say directly, maybe even, you know, throw out some ultimatums or consequences of what'll happen if you don't change. And again, that, that isn't the way to change. We stay focused. We change what we need to change for ourselves so that we can experience this relationship differently so that we can create safety maybe where it is necessary. And then the more we change, not only is a byproduct of the relationship dynamic yeah. going to shift, but they might actually, this person we desire to change might begin to take a more active participatory role. And if they don't, again, as I always say, everything that's happening around us is always information something we can learn to make then a different choice next time with how we continue maybe to navigate that particular relationship moving forward. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.